Welcome to Lockdown Ghost Stories. My name is John Craggs. The stories you are about to see today were created during the lockdown. And today's contributions come from Kerry Freighter, Chantel Riches, Keith Hill, Andrea Sandell, and Rosanna Lanahan. I hope you enjoy, and I'll see you on the other side with details of how you can contribute. And some people say ghosts don't exist, or that they are simply the result of an overactive imagination. And others look for a scientific explanation, believing that when a traumatic event occurs, certain stones can act as a recorder, replaying those events repeatedly through receptive people. Of course, there are those who believe that people who die with unfinished business are burdened with the impossible task of seeing it through and to bring fear to those who see and sense their presence. Now, you always read about ghosts linked to old buildings and ancient grounds, and that is why we never hear of stories linked to modern buildings. Now, for myself, I have no belief one way or the other, but I want to tell you about a conversation I had a few years ago. It's a story linked to a high-rise block of flats, and I'll leave you to judge its merit. Now, we met at a local event, and for the purpose of privacy, I won't say his name. Oh, we started, as all small chats do, we spoke a bit about this and a bit about that, and I told him that when I first moved into the Midlands because of my job, the council had given me temporary accommodation in a flat that was in a tower block. And then he asked me if anything strange had happened to me whilst there. What a strange question, I thought. But then he told me his story. And I've written down his story as best as I can recall. I used to live in a tower block called Bolton Court in Tipton. I was in my teens, so it was about the late 70s, early 80s. The lifts were always breaking down, I remember. And yet the building was seen as cutting edge in the 1960s when they were built. Then, everyone wanted to live in them. It was a lot different from today. After moving in, we started hearing rumours of people wanting to leave because of happenings in the building. But the council refused. I think they put it down to believing the tenants thought the area too rough and they just wanted out. And we lived on the top floor and there were 13 floors in all. And just after a month or so, we started noticing a mysterious clanging sound. It seemed to plague the building. The closer to the top you lived, and the louder it got. And in the January of the following year, residents got together and complained to the council about this clanging that had been going on since the previous September. And to give the council their due, they did send engineers. But they found nothing. They couldn't work out what the disruptive noise was. The council simply put it down to mischievous residents not wanting to live in a block of flats. Council homes were so difficult to get. In fact, as a joke, some councillors dubbed it the Ghost of Bolton, a name that stuck. Now, some people, knowing a little history of the area, rumoured that there was an ancient burial ground nearby and that the noises could be caused by restless spirits returning because they didn't like these tall, ugly monstrosities. <laughs> of course, many laughed at this, but the council felt they had to make a public statement, saying that there were no known burial grounds, ancient or otherwise, in the lands surrounding the block. Something which later by chance, I found out not to be the complete truth. 
You see, I too later became interested in local history and spent a lot of time reviewing old documents and maps just to see if there had been a religious site nearby. What I uncovered was a secret and one that still holds true for today. You see, the site on which the block was built was chosen because of the natural stone in the ground and it made for good foundations. And the uncovered secret was that when the block was built, some 300 bodies were discovered to be buried there in what was originally a medieval plague pit dating from the mid-1300s. And the first body was discovered by the construction company in a location that was to be the centre of the foundations of the block. Of course, there was an archaeological investigation and the findings recorded, but the report was buried deep in the council archives. And it was decided that the bodies should remain in situ as a mark of respect. And in fact, they remain there to this day. But there's more to the story. It appears that there's been a need for the pit to be reopened a number of times over history. The pit was also used during the plague of the early 1600s. So many deaths. So many bodies. Its last known use was the great cholera epidemic of the early 1830s, where bodies were burned and the ashes placed in communal pits such as this one in Tipton. It's no wonder that this location's history was kept quiet. People can be so superstitious. Anyway, I digress. The clanging noises stopped in the march, just as mysteriously as they started in the previous uh, September. Now you might think that that would be an end of it, but there is more. Later that year, rumours started going around the residence of unexplained visitations. Many included a girl. She was between 8 and 12 years old. Some saw her just wandering around, whilst others tell of her holding their hands and whispering into their ears. They remembered her wearing what was thought to be ancient style clothing, whatever that means. And these stories grew so strong that paranormal investigators and mediums were called in, and it was they that told us the girl's name was Alice, and that she lived in a house near to where the block of flats stood, but hundreds of years previously. She told them that she'd passed away from a disease, but she likes to come back to talk to people. Considering her death, she seemed a happy soul, not the same as other visitations I could mention. I never got to hear about the other visitors, but he continued. I have a memory of hearing footsteps in the reception area many times, and yet there was no one else around when I looked. I have no explanation for that. It got to the point where more and more people refused to move into the block as others moved out or away, and the area slowly got worse. The council finally decided to demolish the flats in 1987, with the final destruction in 1990. It's just an empty piece of land now. Nobody wants to live there. But I dare say it will be used one day, when people have forgotten its history. And that's his story. How much of it is true, I cannot say. How much he believed them to be ghosts, I cannot tell. All I can say is that he was very sincere in his telling and very affected by it. So I leave its truth to your own conclusions based on your own beliefs.
One of the most famous stories about Japanese ghosts is the story of Kuchisake Onna, a young, beautiful and extremely vain woman married to a jealous samurai. As a reaction to her latest revealed indiscretion, her husband mutilated her by slashing her lips from ear to ear. According to the legend, the girl's spirit roams the world seeking revenge. A mysterious figure in a long coat. She hides her face behind a surgical mask, selecting not only men as her victims, but also women and children. Her assault always begins with the same question. Am I pretty? A negative answer results in death on the spot. A murder weapon being a pair of scissors, which she uses to rip the victim's body apart. In the case of a yes, she will pull her mask away and showing her slit mouth, she will ask, How about now? The only answer that gives a chance of escape is telling her that she looks average or normal. Denying her beauty fills her with rage and means a sure death. Upon a second affirmative answer, Kuchisake Ono would pull out her pair of scissors and cut the victim's face to resemble her own scar. Although the legend has been known since the Heian period, which is about a thousand years ago, it resurfaces every now and then and captures the public imagination. In 1979, when a few witnesses testified to having seen a monster whose looks corresponded to the description found in the legend, the number of police patrols was increased and children on their way back from school were escorted in groups, organised specifically for that purpose. No, 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 that's, that's, that's all right. Don't worry, no, no, no. No, it's quieter out here, apart from you get the children playing around about back there. Now, listen, this, uh, this shipmate of mine, well, fella I was in one ship or another with, you know, over a few years, it seems that he found himself stuck at the Cape of Good Hope one night. You know, it's that great big boozer on the Fairham Road there, just outside Portsmouth. And it's his first night back, right after four months on blockade, he's in no mood to get on his way. And when Jack Tar don't want Jack Tar, don't go. So rather than have four days fight with him, they say he can have what they call poor Aggie's chamber for the night. <laughs> Though in normal course, they assure him they'd never let it. Right, now, there's been stories about that chamber. Oh God, since forever, it seems. Help. It seems that the poor Aggie in question is some country girl from a war or two back who's come down to Pompey to hold some handsome young midshipman to his promise of marriage, only to find he shoved off the minute he knows that she's in the uh, <clears throat> offing, if you take my meaning. Now, <laughs> she's then cut her throat in that chamber. Families put her out because of the disgrace. It makes them picky for Hampshire, if you ask me, but I'm not judging. And so it's the parish that's put her under, pauper wise, unhallowed on account of her having paid herself out. So, you know, no one knows where she's buried, but everyone's certain that chamber's where she's done it. Now, Billy, that's my mate. He's a Matalo and he's seen a thing or two himself in his time. So, the way he sees it is, it's the first dry bed for four months and it ain't moving. So, what's to fear? So he hauls himself off, wedges the door shut, and he's that uh, weary, if you know what I mean. He drifts off without putting out the nightlight that they've left on the washstand next to the glass. Oh, yeah, there's a looking glass, but right. Now, um, yeah. Now, he's no idea what time he wakes or, or, or why, but last time I saw him, he's still making his Bible oath. What he sees in the glass is this. Well, first of all, it's not one rush light. There's two. 
candlesticks. And not your cheap landlady's tallow neither. Tall, black, chapel, black, wax candles either side of this glass and by their light in the glass he sees a woman and she is thin as all starvation and she's white and slick as clay and she's wearing this like a bridal garland round her head only it's all wound out of churchyard ivy and dead net on it's trailing down and it's twining round her arms and legs and in the one hand she's got a rosary and in the other hand a knife well now, he's seen her in the glass, he figures she's behind him. So he throws himself out of bed, full length, on the floor. He gets himself into a corner, he bundles himself up into a ball, gets his feet underneath him, and he launches himself onto his feet, ready for any sort of exchange of views. Only, there ain't nobody by the bed. And, you know, he can feel the cold, hard whitewash for the wall against his back. And he's just about to laugh out loud, put it down to the last pot of beer he had before retiring, like, when all of a sudden he hears this sweet, soft, rustling noise, like the hem of a silk bridal gown just kissing the planks of the floor. And that rustling sound, it's turning into a sowing, like the merest breath of wind through the leaves of a yew tree. And then he feels that cold arm whitewash behind him. It starts to seep over his shoulders and wrap itself around his arms and it's tightening around his neck. And that whispering, it's saying to him, Oh, Billy boy, you come back. I always wished you would. Now you can stay with me for ever. Next thing he knows, he's waking himself up by smashing his bare feet against the skirting board and he finds it's bright, broad day and he's curled up on the floor and he's got a head like a 60-gun broadside went off right next to him. And... He would write it off to the liquor. Or maybe even some bit of eye jiggery prankery on a part of them what keeps the ass to pay him back for being a pain the night before. And then he looks round and he sees that the door is still wedged shut with that chair. And by the glass there's just the one candlestick all gutted down that set all down the frame of that washstand. Cold, hard, chapel black candle wax set like iron. And when he looks in the glass, a big red weavy poison ivy wheel round his neck. He's out of that house. He's out of the house before they've set breakfast. He's that moiled up. First time in his life he pays his bill. And from that day on, you know, end of every cruise, he'd rather turn over into the leakiest ship with a worst skipper of anything in the fleet rather than go ashore at Pompey. <laughs> and wherever he was, he always said he could never sleep ashore without he was dead drunk. But that was his excuse. Anyway. You think? He always did have that big red wheel round his neck. Couldn't run to another one of these, could you? What I'm about to read to you is actually based on true events. There was once a mother, father and daughter who lived together. Now one morning the mother was in the kitchen and she heard the bifold door shut 
behind her. So she went up to see her daughter who was in the bedroom and asked her why she had shut the door. The daughter replied, it wasn't me, mummy. I didn't shut the door. Both the mum and daughter couldn't understand how the bifold door shut on its own and the father was at work. Anyway, the next morning, both the mum and daughter were back in the kitchen. All of a sudden, the mother could see a silver flickering light next to her daughter's face. It seemed to flicker three times and disappear. Then all of a sudden the daughter saw the same light. This time it was next to her mum's face. Again, it flickered three times and disappeared. Over the next few mornings, the mum and daughter were both back in the kitchen. When the kettle started to switch itself on, and the oven was igniting. Then all of a sudden, daughter's toy tortoise, which was switched in the off position, started to move and sing the same tune it does when it's switched on. But this was not possible as it was switched off. So obviously the mother and daughter were concerned. They didn't understand what was going on. And throughout all of this, the father was at work. The next morning, the mother came downstairs and went into the lounge and noticed her crystal cats had turned round and are now facing towards the wall. This actually happened over a few mornings. The mother started to get concerned. She said to her daughter, I do hope that this isn't my aunt coming back in visitation, because if it is, means a major event is about to happen. The following morning, the mother and father were both in the lounge. As they looked out the window, they saw an old lady standing in their front garden. So the father opened the street door, and as he did, the old lady just disappeared. Now, could this be the mother's aunt? coming back in visitation. Who knows? The Tower Tour Written by Jane Woodhouse Read by Rosanna Lanahan In a corner of the cathedral, people were gathering, ready for the next tour of the tower to begin. A woman sat a little way off, watching as the guide arrived and checked their tickets. She was pleased to see it was the man called Ralph, because unlike some of the others, he always found a way to make the driest facts sound interesting. When she saw Ralph unlock the heavy wooden door, she knew it was time to get ready. She waited until the visitors started to file through, then got up and walked briskly over. If she timed it just right, she knew she could slip inside at the last minute and join the tour without paying. There. It was so easy. She wondered why no one else had ever thought of it. Inside the doorway, there was the boring part to listen to. All the guides had to explain the safety procedure. But Ralph was the only one who tried to make this fun. And if anybody gets stuck at the top, he recited, and she mouthed along with the punchline, I hope you've brought your parachute to get back down. <laughs> She made a point of laughing loudly and was pleased to see him look around to see who'd enjoyed the joke. The first section was easy. An ordinary staircase up into the roof space. Even the fattest Americans could manage this. But she liked to spot the people who would be in trouble later. There was an overweight woman with a backpack. She might be the one. Or the elderly man with a bald head who was already out of breath. She noticed a teenage boy hanging back to play around with some new fangled gadget. She went across and gently touched his arm to tell him to hurry along. The way he jumped and shot off towards his parents. You'd think she'd thrown boiling water over him. They were in a little huddle now. The boy gabbling and pointing in her direction, while the adults kept staring at her. She put out her hands to show that she hadn't meant any harm and was glad to see them stride off to catch up with the rest. 
the staircase led them out onto the walkway across the nave. She liked to hear the tourists gasp when they realised how high they'd already climbed. This was one of her favourite parts of the tour. She loved the view down through the stone arches into the body of the cathedral. The sounds of voices and mobile phones dimmed into silence. The weight of past centuries almost tangible. Ralph gave everyone time to take photographs. It took longer every time, especially now there were so many more Chinese and Japanese dog visitors. They only seemed to see the world through their cameras, snapping endless shots of themselves and each other, never pausing to simply look. She had some fun moving around, trying to position herself in the background of some of their pictures without anyone noticing. What would they say later, she wondered, when they looked and saw another image on their screens. At the foot of the tower, they stood in a huddle while Ralph launched into the story of how and when it had been built. She picked out a young couple with matching tattoos who'd already started to look bored and crept over and whispered a few words in their ears. Now, I don't suppose anyone can tell me the name of the bishop who ordered the construction of the tower, said Ralph, asking the question nobody ever answered. Bishop Henslem in 1286, shouted the tattooed man. He looked every bit as surprised as his partner. Very good. Well done, Ralph applauded. Not many people get that right. The look of total confusion on the couple's face was priceless, and she stayed close to catch their whispered conversation. However, did you know that? I've no idea, it just popped into me head. Didn't know you liked history. I don't. Well, how did you know that then? I told you. It had certainly stirred up something between them. But at least they were now both paying attention to Ralph. He was describing the tons of stone brought across the channel and then taken overland on ox carts. The stonemasons who had left their special marks in hidden places and the hundreds of workers, so many that a whole village had sprung up in the close to house and feed them. She listened carefully to spot the small differences he added each time pleased with how well he told the story. It helped her picture again those first worshippers treading mud and straw into the nave, smothering the fragrance of incense with their stink of wood smoke and unwashed bodies, gazing awestruck at this monument to a fearsome god. Many people were still moved by the sight today, she knew, although it was no longer the fear of hell that kept them coming back. From then on, the climb became much harder. First, there were two steep wooden stairways, the drop clearly visible through the treads, which had to be negotiated in single file. Teenage boy raced up them both, showing that, showing that lithe agility the young are blessed with, while his mother yelled at him to stop. The woman was tempted to run alongside him, but she knew that would be showing off. Besides, it was always more fun to hang back and laugh at the stragglers. She liked to be at the end, letting her hand linger along the handrail, after everyone else had gone ahead, the wood felt warm from their touch, as if a human pulse was still beating through the grain. There was another pause before the most challenging part of all, a narrow spiral staircase that twisted almost vertically upwards. She'd known many tourists give up at this point. Once, a young woman had had hysterics and it had taken four people to guide her back down while she refused to open her eyes. Some of today's group were clearly unsettled, wondering if they weren't overreaching themselves. Still, nobody dropped out, although backpack woman and bald man both needed their partners to persuade them to carry on. The woman managed to insert herself in the queue between the bald man and his wife. He was going slower and slower, his breath coming in great rasping gasps, and was soon holding up everyone behind him. She gave him a gentle push in the back, urging him to hurry along. What the hell are you pushing me like that for? He found enough puff to turn and yell over his shoulder. He was looking directly past her at his wife. I never touched you, love. She looked dumbfounded. You gave me a right old shove. The woman who'd done the pushing said nothing. She tried to hide her delight at the wife getting the blame. The two of them looked as if they were going to have a big argument afterwards, which made it all the better. At the top of the stairwell was a small door, which Ralph opened with an enormous iron key. 
A blast of cool air swept over them. Then they stepped out into the open, shielding their eyes from the bright light. She heard the usual cries of amazement at the first sight of such a spectacular view. Sometimes, when the clouds were low, you might get nothing for your hard work other than mist and drizzle. But today, they really were fortunate. The weather had lifted to reveal a clear vista that stretched all the way along the valleys as far as the mountains. You could see the edges of the town straggling out into the countryside and then the patchwork of fields stitched together by trees and hedgerows, changing colour with the seasons. There was a walkway along the four sides of the tower with enough space for everyone to move around. The parapet with its wide crenellations reached up to chest height but beyond that, there was nothing between them and the huge drop to the ground below. Teenage boy was leaning too far over. She knew only too well the danger he was in and went to grab his jacket and pull him back. But his mother got there first. The boy shrugged her off roughly and walked away while she yelled at him for being so stupid. The woman was surprised to see them behave like that in front of her. But neither of them seemed to care that she was standing nearby. The tourists spread out, chatting animatedly and taking photographs, pointing out landmarks while the women stood apart. She watched the people in families and couples or with friends. It seemed they all had somebody and that she was the only one alone. Even Ralph found ways to bring his wife and grandchildren into his commentary, which showed he had someone waiting for him at the end when the tour ended. She hovered around the different groups, longing to reach out to them hoping they would pause and draw her in. But it never happened. She tried to join in a conversation with some students, but they only carried on talking over her and never even looked in her direction. Backpack woman seemed friendly enough and she tapped her on the shoulder as if to say, I'm here too, look at me. But the woman just brushed off the place her hand had touched and linked arms with her husband. These times she was so overcome with a feeling, like the memory of a sharp pain, so strong it almost caused her to double over. This, she thought, must be what they call loneliness. The woman turned aside and walked off by herself towards the far corner. She was always drawn to this spot, although it was the one place that the tourists tended to avoid. Here she knew she would find gaps in the stonework wide enough to place your feet, making it possible to climb upwards. She found herself taking the first step and then another, as some hidden pattern began to pull her higher. Now she was standing on the very top of the wall. Nobody tried to stop her and no voice was raising to telling her to come down. She felt the rush of wind pushing against her, causing her to sway and nearly topple to the sickening drop below. But she didn't falter. For an instant, she felt a barely reachable memory of the first time she had done this very same thing, when she had stood at the highest point, holding her arms wide, ready to take one final step forward, believing she would soar through the air like a bird. And then it was done. The woman was standing in the corner of the cathedral as the tourists emerged through the doorway at the end of their tour. They were chatting and laughing, thrilled with the spectacle they had seen, all just relieved the climb was over. She let the living flow through her and past her, before merging back into the shadows. She wouldn't have long to wait. The next tower tour would be starting soon. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. Now, whatever your beliefs are in the paranormal, there's always something which can't be explained, isn't there? From things that go bump in the night, to maybe seeing someone who isn't there. And we would like your story. So, send your five minute video to me at UKActorsNetwork at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time on Lockdown Ghost Stories. Sweet dreams. <laughs>